everybody. This is Dr. Nigro with the notes screencast for the first part of our unit on Newton's Third Law and momentum. All right, so before we move into Newton's Third Law, just a reminder. So what is a force? So remember, we've defined a force as a push or pull between two objects. And that push or pull has to result in a change in motion. Oops, change in motion. So, you know, just think about opening a door, or closing a door, or giving someone a push in a chair, all right? Those would all be considered forces, all right? So what exerts force in this universe? Well, I mean, really everything, all right? If we're gonna be really specific, everything, whoops, everything, that has matter, all right? So energy, maybe not, but everything with matter. Although there could be some argument about magnetism, but we'll deal with that later, all right? Forces have magnitude, which means a numerical value, and they have direction, all right? Which tells us which direction they are moving in, which makes them a vector quantity, all right? The net force, that's acting on an object is the sum of all of the forces that are working on the same object. And that word same is gonna be important. All right, so we learned back in our last unit that Newton's second law tells us that that net force is gonna be equal to the mass of that object times its acceleration. Or we could think about that net force as the sum, which is what the symbol sigma stands for, of all of the forces acting on it. So basically you could say F net is equal to force one plus force two plus force three, four, five, six, however you want to look at it. And remember, we have split our forces into two directions, the horizontal forces and then the vertical forces. We will not be dealing with forces at an angle, okay? All right, so we've dealt with Newton's first law, which is all about inertia, Newton's second law, which is F net equals mass times acceleration. And now it's talking about, time to talk about Newton's third law. All right, so Newton's third law is sometimes known as the action-reaction law. And the reason that we call it that is it basically states that for every action, there is an equal but opposite oops reaction sorry lady i'm all in your way all right this law states that when two objects interact they eat inter they exert force on one another all right so for an example let's think about sitting in a chair so i have an example a picture of a woman sitting on a chair over here all right, so are you exerting force on your chair so if we think about this woman uh, the answer to that would be Yes, and so if we showed that force, she is exerting a force downward, just like this, all right? So then the question is, if I'm exerting a force on the chair, then why don't I fall through that chair, all right? And the answer comes from Newton's third law, which is that the chair must be exerting a force on us, or this lady, sorry. All right, so in other words, the chair, at the same time that she's pushing down on the chair, the chair is pushing up on her. All right, so since she does not fall through the chair and the chair does not move up through her, these forces must be equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. All right, and this is the heart of Newton's third law, this idea of equal but opposite. So if we think about it in terms of forces, the force of the woman is equal to the negative force exerted by the chair, all right? Where the numerical value for force is the same, but the negative sign with chair just shows that it's working in the opposite direction, all right? So according to Newton's third law, forces are always going to be in pairs, and we call these pairs action, oh, not actin where we are, but not acting. Action, reaction, pairs. All right, so let's look at a couple of examples of how we identify these pairs. All right, so when two objects interact, 
one object exerts a force on the other and the other reacts to that force. So if we have our example of our hockey player, all right, the hockey player's stick hits the puck. And then at the same time, the puck hits the stick. And it really is as simple as that. This hits that, that hits this. All right, so if we think about someone rowing, all right, they use their oars, so the oar pushes the water, and at the same time, the water pushes the oar. All right, so if you push backwards on the water with your oar, the water reacts by pushing forward, and that's why the boat moves forward, all right? We also have a runner, and the runner uses these starting blocks, particularly for sprints, and so the runner pushes on that block, and at the same time, the block reacts by pushing on the runner. All right, and since the runner is pushing backwards on the blocks, the blocks react by pushing forward on the runner, which allows them to jump out of the start blocks, all right? So reaction, action and reaction pairs do not cancel. And this is a really important concept. So I'm going to put a star here. All right. The reason that these forces don't cancel like we saw back in our last unit is that they are acting on different objects. All right. So when we drew our force diagrams before, we would look at all of the forces acting on that single object. When we talk about Newton's third law, though, we're looking at one object interacting with a second object. So we need to draw two separate force diagrams. And one of the forces in each of those diagrams will be the action or reaction force. All right? So let's talk a little bit about what else is important when we deal with Newton's third law. All right? Well, one thing you need to keep in mind, because sometimes these action-reaction pairs are hard to spot, is that mass is going to be important in thinking about what's going to happen, all right? So when we talk about mass, let's use this example of walking down the hall, all right? So you're walking down the hall, and your back foot pushes this way as you walk down the hall, all right? So your foot interacts with the floor. So your foot pushes floor backwards, all right, so the reaction to that is going to be that the floor pushes foot forward. All right, now if we think about which of the two objects moved, it's clearly the foot. All right, the floor, no matter what, is not going to move. So the question is why? All right, well, the floor is connected to the building. And that building has a lot of mass, which means it has a lot of inertia. All right. And remember, inertia tells us that if something is doing some sort of motion, it doesn't want to change. So the more inertia something has, the more mass something has, the more resistant it is to change. The building has a lot of inertia. So it does not really want to move. And it does not matter if you or 10 of your friends or the entire student body at AB all move at the same time. The building is not going to move, all right? But that doesn't mean the force isn't being applied. It is, all right? But it's not enough to overcome the inertia, all right? So lots of mass means lots of inertia, all right? And it can be difficult to change the motion of massive objects, all right? So we can't discount mass. Mass is going to be very important in thinking about what moves and what doesn't, all right? But we got to remember the force that's interacting between these two, even though the floor doesn't move, the force exerted by your foot is equal but opposite to the force exerted by the floor. So again, equal but opposite. All right? All right, so I'm going to stop this screencast here, and I'm going to have you come back for a second screencast, and we're going to look at momentum, collisions, and conservation of momentum. Okay?